Welcome, everyone, this afternoon. I'm Gary Hall, the dean. This is a special wrong way Corrigan forum we have this morning uh, because we're facing the human rights porch where the new bust of Jonathan Daniels is, uh, is now complete and we're going to be able to look at. But today's forum is not so much about the life and witness of Jonathan Daniels. I talked about that in my sermon and uh, there's plenty you can find on the website about that. Today is really more about this uh, installation and the way the cathedral welcomes and um, honors people who have been um, involved in the struggle for human rights, uh, not only in our nation, but in our world. And the Jonathan Daniels uh, bust is only the latest in, an, in a series that includes uh, many, as you can see, Eleanor Roosevelt, John Walker, Bishop Oscar Romero, Rosa Parks, and uh, Mother Teresa. Uh, just a personal word, and then I'll turn it over to um, Diane Nye, our cathedral archivist. So Ruth Fry and Kathy Hall and I just are back from a three-day pilgrimage uh, to Alabama. We went first to Birmingham, then to Selma, then to Montgomery, uh, and then finally to Hainville, where Jonathan Daniels was shot and killed. And um, one of the things we did there we, it was a wonderful, just transformative experience. But one of the things we did there was uh, yesterday, there was a kind of pilgrimage around the town of Hainville itself. Uh, just to sort of briefly recap the story, Jonathan Daniels was a seminarian at Episcopal Theological School. 1965, he decided to go down and work for voter registration in Alabama. <clears throat> he was part of a demonstration in Fort Deposit, was arrested for um, some trumped up charge, and spent uh, the, a week, essentially, in jail with other civil rights workers, voter registration workers, in the Lowndes County Jail in Hainville. So yesterday we, uh, and then he, after a week, they were released from jail. Uh, he and Ruby Sales and a Catholic priest went to, um, uh, the Varner's cash store to get a cold drink uh, after a week in jail uh, where they couldn't bathe or uh, have any sanitary facilities and uh, uh, a deputy sheriff with a shotgun was standing on the front inside the store. Uh, Ruby Sales and Jonathan Daniels walked up. Uh, she's African American uh, and uh, Jonathan Daniels essentially pushed her out of the way and uh, Tom Coleman, the man's name was, shot and killed Jonathan Daniels. Also shot the Catholic priest, but didn't kill him. Uh, and uh, pled uh, self-defense and was acquitted by an all-white, all-male jury. Uh, and so <clears throat> our, our observance yesterday centered around the town, around the courthouse. We started at the courthouse, then we proceeded over to the jail, then to the site of the cash store, uh, and then back to uh, the courthouse. And it's a very powerful thing, and just two things I want to say about it, and then really turn it over to Diane. One of them was, you know, we, we live in a time when we've kind of come around a sanitized, uh, uh, a kind of uh, sanitized conventional wisdom narrative of the 1960s. We've uh, really forgotten how divisive the Vietnam War was. Uh, we've really forgotten how bloody the civil rights uh, struggle was. And, and those of us who lived through it even have somewhat forgotten it. And so <clears throat> it was really something just to be in that area and just to uh, sort of see both at the Pettus Bridge and at the interpretive centers and at the marker of Viola Liuzzo's death and in Hainville and in Montgomery, just to see what people actually experienced and to hear from people who had been there. The second thing was, and Kathy and I were talking about this last night, that um, what you really realize when you're there is just how brave these people were, you know? I mean, those of us that went on the pilgrimage, we had to sort of deal with, you know, with a couple days without air conditioning and, uh, you know, certain minor discomforts. But when you're in a town like Hainville, which has, you know, done a lot to come to terms with its history, I'm not trying to beat them up, 
But when you're in a town like Hainville, you realize that 50 years ago, the entire power of the state was arrayed against the civil rights workers. You know, uh, the guy that shot and killed Jonathan Daniels was a deputy sheriff. And so these people were not only opposing culture, they were opposing power. They were opposing state-sponsored violence. And um, so my respect, you know, I still am trying to figure out what this weekend means to me, but the, the, my admiration for Jonathan Daniels and uh, Ruby Sales and for Julian Bond, by the way, who just died yesterday, who was here on a panel with me at the cathedral just a year ago, um, uh, that whole generation of civil rights workers really, white and black, really uh, did the right thing in a time when it was, the right thing was very hard to do. And so um, I think it's, and my whole ministry has in a sense been bookended by the life and ministry of Jonathan Daniels. And so I'm extremely proud and happy to be part of an institution that is uh, uh, recognizing him with this uh, bust that is has gone into our human rights porch. Okay, that's enough from me. It's now my pleasure to introduce Diane Nye, the cathedral archivist, who is going to tell us a bit not only about Jonathan Daniels, but about how things like this get done. Thanks, Gary. It's always hard following Gary's eloquence, so have pity on a historian here. Uh, it is my great pleasure to share with you a little bit about the history of the human rights porch and some interesting information about those who are honored there. Those include First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, Archbishop Oscar Romero, Bishop John Walker, Mother Teresa, Mrs. Rosa Parks, and now, of course, Jonathan Daniels. The Human Rights Porch is the first designated area visitors enter when they walk through or as they walk through towards the nave. And that is very fitting. It's a very fitting in introduction to this cathedral because it reflects the cathedral's historic commitment to the struggle for human rights. From our first bishop, Henry Yates Satterley, at the turn of the last century, who strove to improve the conditions of the city's African-American population, to Dean Fr uh, Frank Sayer in the 1950s and 60s and his involvement with the civil rights movement, to Bishop Walker, an international leader of the anti-apartheid movement, in the 70s and 80s, and then to our own present Dean, Gary Hall, and Bishop Marianne Buddy. All these and many others who have served the cathedral heeded the call that Bishop Walker said was the responsibility of every person of faith, and that was to support the struggle for human rights. The Human Rights Porch then uh, came about as a natural expression of the cathedral's commitment to that struggle. Following the dedication of the cathedral in 1990, discussion began as to what sculpted imagery could grace this area that would provide inspiration and would honor those who had led the struggle in modern times. How were these particular individuals chosen? Well, we've probably all heard it said that history is sometimes made by extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, but other times is made by ordinary people doing extraordinary things, and that concept is certainly reflected here. Ellen Roosevelt, Archbishop Romero, Bishop Walker and Mother Teresa were extraordinary in the scope of their endeavors and in the breadth of their accomplishments. Eleanor Roosevelt, First Lady, Ambassador to the World, a woman unafraid to look upon the deepest, saddest things in human suffering, visiting soldiers in military hospitals, visiting refugee camps. Uh, Mrs. Roosevelt told the story of an old woman who fell to her knees in front of Mrs. Roosevelt groaning, and Mrs. Roosevelt said that she helped her up, but I could not speak. What could one say at the end of a life that had brought such complete despair? Mrs. Roosevelt answered that despair by, among other things, being instrumental in drafting the United Nations Declaration of Universal Rights in 1948 and championing that document until her death in 1962. Archbishop Oscar Romero, Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of San Salvador during the political turbulence of the 1970s, a fierce and outspoken champion of El Salvador's poor and oppressed, demanding justice for them and for all in Latin America. He, only shortly after he spoke to Pope John Paul II to express concern about the military oppression in his country, Archbishop Romero was assassinated while saying mass in a small chapel in a hospital in March 1980. Just two weeks before, a reporter had asked him about the possibility that he might be murdered by his government. And Romero replied, martyrdom is a grace of God that I do not believe I deserve. 
but if God accepts the sacrifice of my life, let my death be for my people's liberation. Bishop John Walker of our own Diocese of Washington was a leader in not only the anti-apartheid movement, but in establishing avenues of interfaith communication around the world, in promoting education in underserved communities, in speaking out on the social issues of the day, such as taking care of those with AIDS and ordination of women. When Bishop Walker died in 1989, he was remembered as being soft-spoken and conciliatory, even as he relentlessly pushed for monumental change. Mother Teresa founded the Religious Order of the Missionaries of Charity in 1950, with the intention of serving the poor, the sick, and the shunned in Calcutta. Her order's work spread to other countries, and in 1979, Mother Teresa was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. This physically unassuming woman, who admitted to periods of depression and despair, recognized the cumulative value of human endeavor, of one person's efforts. We ourselves feel that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean, she said, but the ocean would be less because of that missing drop. These four extraordinary people are joined by Rosa Parks and Jonathan Daniels, both of whom would likely be the first to describe themselves as ordinary people. As Mrs. Park so famously said, I didn't get on that bus with the intention of being arrested. I got on that bus with the intention of going home. Mrs. Parks was a seamstress coming home from a long day's work in December 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama. She boarded the bus, she paid her fare, she sat down, and the bus driver asked her to move to the back of the bus so that a white man could have her seat. She refused. Her arrest set in motion a 381-day bus boycott that eventually led to the U.S. Supreme Court decision outlawing segregation in city on city buses, which is why Rosa Parks has been called the mother of the civil rights movement. Though she herself did not remain active an active leader in the movement, simply by living her ordinary life, she gave answer to those who said she was not their equal. Mrs. Parks was presented with the Medal of Freeman by President Clinton in 1996, and when she died in 2005, she became the first woman and only the second African American uh, honored by having her body lie in state in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. And now Jonathan Daniels, whom Gary has talked about, uh, born in New Hampshire, he was a New Englander, a Yankee, uh, entered Harvard for graduate studies in 1961, and a year later, later was called to the priesthood and entered what was then called the Episcopal Theological School in Cambridge. In 1965, Reverend Daniels, along with dozens of others studying at ETS, felt a calling to the civil rights movement and went to Alabama to register African American voters. Daniels was not a leader in the movement. He was not a dazzling visionary. He was a realist who wrote in a magazine article a few months before he died about his service in Alabama. There are good men here just as there are bad men. We have activists who risk their lives to confront a people with the challenge of freedom and a nation with its conscience. We have neutralists who cautiously seek to calm troubled waters. We have men about the work of reconciliation who are willing to reflect upon the cost and pay it. Daniels paid it forward, his death becoming an inspiration for others. The cathedral honors these individuals and others who strive for the universal recognition of human rights, as Gary said. In 2006, a half-boss in the porch was dedicated that encompasses that ideal. Designed by artist Chaz Fagan and carved by Sean Callahan, this boss represents the passage from the book of the prophet Amos, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Future generations at the cathedral will honor others in the human rights porch, but we can all hope for the day when human rights will be so very ordinary in our world that there will be no need to honor it. And now Jim Shepard and, and uh, Sean Callahan. Hi, I'm Jim Shepard. I'm the Director of Preservation and Facilities here at the Cathedral. And um, before I introduce Sean Callahan, a stone carver, I thought I would just uh, briefly talk about the process of how some of these uh, sculptures come about. Um, Diane gave the history, but I was just going to sort of touch on our approval process in-house and how we actually get to uh, carving the stone. So uh, uh, Dean Hall uh, started this whole conversation. He is our chief iconographer in that role as Dean. Uh, so obviously the uh, re first recommendation for something to be carved in the fabric comes from the Dean. 
and that uh, goes through a review process that includes our Facilities and Fine Arts Committee and our uh, cathedral chapter. Um, once they've approved that, of course, we need to find the money. Um, so nothing gets carved until we have the money in hand. So uh, with J the Jonathan Daniels sculpture, we were very fortunate to have some very enthusiastic supporters from New Hampshire, where he was from, who uh, fi financially supported this effort that enabled us to get underway. Uh, so in November, we had the money in hand and we were able to select a sculptor. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, Chaz Fagan was the chosen sculptor. So Chaz actually has done a few of the uh, sculptures already that are in the human rights porch. He uh, carved Mother Teresa, which is here in the middle of the table here, by the way. I'll welcome you all to come up and look at the table closely after we're done. Uh, and he also uh, uh, carved uh, Rosa Parks. So he was a natural uh, choice. He also, as uh, Diane mentioned, carved this half Boston, a mock-up of which is done here. Um, so the uh, Facilities and Fun Arts Committee agreed that he would be the uh, chosen sculptor. And his process, uh, he's an uh, uh, artist out, based out of North Carolina. Uh, he starts basically by doing a lot of research. Um, so he uh, basically sought out photographs and did a lot of reading on Jonathan Daniels. Uh, you can see some of these photographs here on the uh, tripod. Um, he tried to get black and white photographs that uh, looked at Jonathan from various different angles. Because you, as you can imagine, this is going to be a carving that's up high. So he wanted to make sure he understood uh, what Jonathan looked like. Uh, we have a f actually four different photo photographs that represent various components of, uh, and time periods in his life. So there's a photograph of him from Virginia Military Institute, one of him as an activist, uh, one of him as a preacher, and also one of him working with children. So he was a very uh, kind and compassionate man. And uh, so those photographs really capture, I think, those various different aspects of his ministry. Um, Chaz looks at these photographs. He really uh, does a lot of reading um, and gets in depth as to understanding the, the character of the person. And then he translates uh, these photographs into a design sketch. So this is relatively small. I apologize, but you can certainly come forward and look at this later. Um, but what he does is he, he does a sketch, a hand sketch or cartoon of what uh, the sculpture will look like up, up um, as a label mold in the location uh, on the west uh, uh, front. And uh, basically, that sketch goes through an approval process through our Facilities and Fine Arts Committee. If we all sign off on it, he has the uh, authorization to proceed to start to do a clay sculpture. So you can see it's actually uh, quite a good likeness if you get up close the sketch. But it also ha takes into consideration the location of where it's going to be carved. Um, once he has done the sketch, what he does is he starts to carve a, uh, a clay model. And the clay model is actually here. Um, but I'll hold up this plaster cast because you'll be able to see it a little bit better. But basically, he starts um, by carving it directly in front of him. So he, he looks straight on based on the photographs. And he uses clay to carve the likeness so that he sees it uh, straight on. And it was interesting for him to describe, by the way, he was invited to participate today. Unfortunately, he had a, a family obligation, so he wasn't able to come. Uh, so he sends his regards. But um, he, he likes to start by looking straight on with, at the clay and working around it. It was interesting to hear him talk. He basically would start to sculpt, let it sit for a while, walk around it, make adjustments over time. Um, and then what he does is he actually puts it up on a pedestal that approximates the height of where it would be located when he does the final carving, because obviously you're going to want to make adjustments as to how it's perceived when it's up high. So when he has it up a little higher, he makes some adjustments. Um, I think one of his challenges that he conveyed was he was really trying to capture both Jonathan's youth and uh, that uh, dichotomy of his youth and also the, the tragic uh, circumstance of his death all in, in one sculpture. Um, in the end, after he actually started working on this, this was supposed to be carved uh, in the east label mold of the uh, west front uh, south arch. He actually changed his mind midway after he'd started working with the model because he felt as though the light that came in, the west front doors, would be more appropriately highlighting the youth of the uh, carving if it was located on the uh, west side instead of the east side. Uh, and it was interesting to hear him talk. Uh, obviously, Mother Teresa is someone that has a lot of uh, folds in her face and fabric around her that catch shadow. Uh, because Jonathan was so young, 
uh, he wanted to make sure there was some highlight on him that featured that, that youth in the carving. Uh, so uh, once he's actually done the clay model, the clay model goes through the Facilities and Fine Arts Committee and gets final approval. Um, and at that point, it's handed over to the stone carver. So just so you understand the process, there's a sculptor and a carver. And the sculptor ushers the process up to a certain point and then hands it over to the stone carver. And I'm going to do the same right now. So I'm going to introduce Sean Callahan, who's our in-house master stone carver, who translated uh, Chaz Fagan's wonderful sculpture into stone. Hi. Um, as he was explaining, Chaz is a sculptor, um, and as such, he doesn't really work in the medium of stone. Not to say sculptors cannot, he just, he's one that doesn't. And, uh, and it's my job as a stone carver to faithfully reproduce his vision. So I, I don't... Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> so Chaz presents this final sculpture to the committee, and they approve it, and then it gets handed off to me. And Sometimes it would go to a plaster a model maker, but in this case it was a simple enough shape where I can do the model making myself. So I would take a urethane product and brush it on in, in uh, several layers, and they'd set up. And this is what you end up with. This is about uh, four or five coats of urethane built up. So I would just seal the model and then brush this on, let one coat dry a little bit. Not too dry, you, don't, you need it to be tacky so the coats will adhere and then just keep building up till it gets thick enough where it can support itself. And then you make a mother mold. So you can imagine this is around the model, but then I can't use it, it's floppy. I need something to support it when I make the final cast, so I make a rigid mother mold around that. And that's just applied with a trowel. Again, you mix it up wet and let it dry. That's kind of a, kind of a fiberglass material. And then once that's set up, then I can demold it take it all apart and get, it, get the uh, clay out of the model, get the clay out of the mold, <coughs> and then put it all back together. Can you hold this thing? Oh. <laughs> I was going to say. You can imagine the rubber mold inside the mother mold. And then so it's just sitting on the table, and you just pour it full of plaster. And that's what you end up with there. But we're still not done there, because um, in this particular case, it's not just a, a freestanding head. I'm carving it on, onto an existing wall. And so we have to figure out how we're going to marry the two, the wall with the sculpture. So we have a Rosa Parks figure here that demonstrates how they actually sit in the wall. And uh, if you see that. So I have to make a casting of the wall as, as well. And then. Once I have a rigid plaster of the wall and a rigid plaster of the, of, the, of the sculpture of the person, then Chaz and I work together to position it, the two in space, to see how we want it to look. Because that's a critical part for, as far as Chaz wants it to look a certain way, the way he intended it when he sculpted it. So it has to have a certain angle looking down at the floor. So that's what we work out together. And then we make another final mold of the two together. So it's a, it's a it takes a couple months, really, to get this done, because uh, you have to let the mold set up, come back, do it again. And so this is the actual working model that I worked from to, to complete the sculpture on the wall. <coughs> and you can actually see the, uh, we use what we call a pointing machine to measure and map, map out in three dimensions. So you can see the little points, these little pencil dots all over the sculpture are the, are the points I use to measure and plot out how I would carve the sculpture. And these are the same thing. These are, these are actual models that were used for the carvings. Do uh, you remember the artist's name? This is not Chaz's work. This is earlier. These, these works were done in probably the 90s. But, uh, but again, these are, are freestanding and were sculpted in a studio and then placed in the niche. So it didn't have that same problem to work out. But, uh, but these are the actual working models of what's up there now. And another point here. So here's Chaz's uh, cartoon for the boss stone. And you can see when he goes, sometimes when you go from a, a two-dimensional piece to a three-dimensional piece, the composition, you might have some issues you didn't, didn't anticipate until you go to three dimensions. You might see some subtle changes he made as he went from two dimensions to three dimensions. And uh, this particular piece, this is a stone piece that I carved just as a demonstration to the committee because they weren't sure 
if this would work in stone, they, they wanted to see how the waterfall would work out. So I actually carved this mock up, so that's why it's not complete. But you can see that I finished the waterfall and the figures just enough so they would be satisfied that it could be, they would look all right in place, in situ. So, but this is also interesting because it has, you can see the points still existing on the model here where I did not complete it, but you can, it helps to demonstrate the working process. And I guess from there. So was there a plaster cast from this? There is, but uh, I'm not sure where it is. It might be. Do you know where it is, Joe? Oh, it's, it's so, so, so in other words, the, the, <laughs> the, this, this painting translated similarly, similarly to the Myrick sculpture, I, I mean the Daniel sculpture, uh, from basically a, a two-dimensional Right, image. right. He'll start off with a the, with the painting. Or and then Chaz did a, a they, sculpting of this. Then they approve, the, they approve the cartoon, then he'll make a, a, a mock-up in clay, and they'll say what changes need to be made, or they'll approve it, and then once that's approved, then again, make a plaster model, and then from that do the actual carving. So uh, you'll see when we actually go out and see the sculpture on the human rights porch, but uh, just to understand the challenge, obviously the, some of the figures, as Sean mentioned, like uh, Eleanor Roosevelt or Bishop Walker here, they were able to be carved in a studio um, versus the boss stone and these uh, label molds that have to be carved on site. So that adds its own challenge. It means we need to put a scaffold up and it means that lighting uh, problems uh, or lighting problems uh, and, and access access just just when you got the wall against your sculpture it creates its own problems about how I get in there to finish so that that's its own tedious nature to it but so so the real craft of obviously the stone carving is translating what the artist envisioned into the stone and making modifications on site um, as Sean has described and he can point out when he gets up there I think Chaz and Sean looked at the location of the bust initially and made some adjustments as to its location. And then Sean had to basically add his own artistic overlay to adjust the, the bust and, and the carvings so that it, it looked at the best it could in the shadow and in the situ on the human rights porch. So uh, I'm gonna actually turn it over to Ruth uh, Fry now to sort of close this out and open it up for questions. Good morning. My name is Ruth Fry, and I serve as director of programs here. And um, I want to thank Diane and Sean and Jim um, for their work on this uh, forum this morning. Um, I also, we are going to have a little time for question and answers, and then invite everybody to go out to the Human Rights Porch to actually see these real sculptures out there. But before we do that, I just want to remind you, um, you should have gotten a card on your chair. If you didn't, um, please see me after this, and I'll make sure you have one, to save the date for October 11th. What's next for this Jonathan Daniels um, honoring, uh, the cathedral honoring John, uh, Jonathan Daniels, is that on October 11th, we will dedicate this uh, carving. And, um, and that will be done at Evensong on, on Sunday the 11th. And then um, after that, Ruby Sales, who was the young woman who uh, Jonathan Daniels saved um, when he was killed, will be with us. Um, she is a, uh, a human uh, civil rights worker and uh, is the co-founder of Spirit House in Atlanta. So um, we hope you can join us for that time and please um, spread the word. And um, I just want to add one more thing to what Gary said about Jonathan Daniels um, in terms of what the structure was that um, he and his colleagues were fighting against um, down in, in the South at the time. One of the, the other thing that he was down there doing was to integrate the Episcopal Church. And he went with an integrated group to the Episcopal Church in Selma and was turned away. They were told they were not welcome to worship there. Um, so it was not only the, the civil structure, but it was also the religious structure that they were working against. And having just come back from there yesterday, it was very powerful to be in those places. And um, it was wonderful to see how things have changed, but also, as Gary has said, there is much more work to do. Um, so now uh, we're going to open it up for questions for um, Diane, for Jim, for Sean, um, for Gary, for me, whatever you'd like. Um, and then we'll go out to the human rights porch and take a look at at everything there. So are there any questions that anybody has? No? Oh, there? Here we go. How do you hope this will be an inspiration? 
how do we hope that this will be an inspiration? One of the things about the, the, all the people in the human rights porch and, and the cathedral itself, it is a, it's a teaching um, cathedral. I mean, all of the, the carvings here tell a story. So when, pe when visitors come, when worshipers come, there's an opportunity to talk about the lives or the biblical stories, if that's the case, not only in the windows, but the carvings, um, both the metal, the stone. Um, so there's, there's always an opportunity to inspire current and future generations through what is here in the cathedral. Yes. What is your, your vision for this project? How do you select uh, the people who too are to be carved? And what is the selection process? And do you have others uh, coming down the pike? Uh, I touched on that a little bit, but the, as I mentioned earlier, the dean is really the chief iconographer, so the ideas start with him, and then that is uh, recommended to the Facilities and Foreign Arts Committee, which then reviews, discusses that, and gives a recommendation to our chapter, and then they vote on it. So that's the process. Uh, right now, there is one um, label mold that is uncarved in the human rights porch, and obviously we're still considering who uh, that will be, but there are some... Uh, overlays in that uh, the, whoever is honored needs to have passed, and they have need to have passed for at least five years. So that puts that into uh, context, but um, we're still having conversations about who might be next. So. Question? Well, there's always opportunity to um, have more conversation on the human rights porch. Um, we'll all be out there for a little while, so if you would like to join us, um, the human rights porch, in case you don't know, is straight through these doors right here. We'll remove that rope um, so it can all get through, and you can see the actual carving. And also, yes, please um, feel free to come up and take a closer look at any of the models up here. Thank you so much for being with us this morning.